Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 5, Episode 11, titled Miami Squeeze. It originally premiered on February 17th, 1989. You know, I always enjoy the episodes that have Miami in the title. And then I looked, I'm like, oh yeah, this is the only one. (laughs) (laughs) Told ya. (laughs) The writer for this episode is Robert Ward. That name should sound familiar. He is the co-producer. This is his sixth writing credit. He's got two more coming. It is also written by Peter McCabe, who has written four other episodes. This is his last writing credit. And Ted Mann. Now... I know you're thinking to yourself, Ted Mann, that's a ridiculous name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's man as in M-A-N-N. Uh, oh, uh, related. So maybe oh. something, you know, Michael Mann. Michael's less responsible little brother or something, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Gotta get him a job. <laughs> well, Mom won't leave me alone. <laughs> Come on, Ted, you're going to work with me. According to what might be a fake person, but probably not Ted Mann, aside from his funny name, he also wrote a lot of a lot of stuff. He won an Emmy for writing for NYPD Blue. Ooh. Yeah. Huh. And he also wrote something called Disco Beaver from Outer Space in 1978. Well, I think we have to find yes. that. <laughs> for research purposes, I need to see yes. Disco Beaver. <laughs> and it's from Outer Space, not just a regular Disco Beaver. <laughs> it's a space one. Yeah, a beaver from outer space. <laughs> not just a regular beaver. <laughs> a regular one. The director on this episode is Michelle Manning, who also directed Fruit of the Poison Tree and also like one of two female directors to ever direct anything for Miami Vice. I, I just you want know. to clarify. So you wouldn't watch a movie about a regular disco beaver? <laughs> no, no. It's got to be the outer space one. I don't got time for regular ones. <laughs> regular disco beavers are too common. Yeah, that's boring. <laughs> well, speaking of movies that Melissa watches before I started checking into each other's lives, Melissa saw creed 2 now let me set the table here everyone just hold on for a second there are people who love rocky and then there is melissa melissa worships the rocky franchise all of them even considers rocky balboa and rocky 5 as part of the story arc i do unlike me who just skips them and pretends like they don't exist that's because you're not a real rocky fan (laughs) if you don't love him at his worst how can you love him at his best (laughs) of course when creed 2 landed Gotta run out and go see Creed yes. 2. Melissa, without any spoilers. Now, now listen, everyone out there. If you're worried about spoilers, just skip ahead like three minutes. Just to be safe. But Melissa, spoiler-free <laughs> review. How does Creed 2 fit in the Rocky story arc? I think it fits very well in the story arc. It's the perfect, for me, it was the perfect balance of the old, like the Rocky franchise. Because obviously, spoiler, it has Ivan Drago in it. But they also do a nice job of making new stuff. And it's not focused all this. It was not cliche. And it's not boring. And it's not like basically we did. We just did a reboot. You know, no, they had their they added their own stuff to it, its own spin to it. It has a montage, you know, but it's not the, <laughs> it's not your usual montage. So yeah, it was it was we, we all liked it. <laughs> Are there any cameos by the robot? <laughs> I can't give that away. Well, I mean, oh, I must have hit on something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the robot does have a sex tape. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> uh, I have not seen it, but I have heard a little bit about the press for it. I know that Stallone has been, uh, he basically came out while press to it and said, uh, like, how much he appreciates being able to pass the torch. Reading about it and stuff, I realized how many people did not realize that he wrote rocky and the rocky franchise like he was more than just the actor chosen to play him rocky is kind of him yeah no it's him and he co-wrote this movie which means that he did not he did not co-write um creed one the first creed and they basically apparently according to him and everybody else they begged him to come on for creed he was was done when they did he was happy with it the way they had done rocky balboa it was like okay i'm done and uh ryan coogler and Michael B. Jordan basically begged him to come back. So he has officially the statement that he has done after all the press is that he's done. He's not going to be this was this was his bowing out. So he's done being Rocky. Yeah. Tears being shed. But <laughs> <laughs> but apparently he's not done being Rambo. He- so we need to talk about that. <laughs> he's filming Rambo five right now. 
with a big franchise like this, do you think that the franchise will get better without him, like the George Lucas Star Wars once Disney took over? Or do you think that it's just going to go downhill without Stallone? I think that the the way they set it up, I think it'll, it, I don't think, I definitely don't think it's going to go downhill. I think it'll stay, you know, it's going to stay, it's its, it's own thing. What what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. It's going to, it's its own thing. That's its own story. And that's what's good about it. And that's what the best part about it. I love, for the record, I can't say anything, but I love Michael B. Jordan. So. And that's like, what I was going <laughs> to ask on, on the last note here about, <laughs> about Creed 2. How did you feel watching that movie, seeing Avon working with Wallace? Oh my God! It was like something. <laughs> it went back in time. Like, don't you know he's the one? Why you're dead, Wallace? <laughs> and they're like friends in it. Avon's in it. He's training him. It's like that's why you can't trust him. That's why he didn't train you that good. Just saying, you can't trust him. For all, for all you un people wondering what the hell we're talking about, we're talking about the Wire. The Wire and Michael B. Jordan yes. in the first season. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I can't I can't do anything about that. Sorry. But. <laughs> well, speaking of kids that make dumb mistakes, we have a dumb kid in this episode and it's going to be joined by another dumb kid. But there's more than one dumb kid in this episode. About... <laughs> Let's go well, talk about... I think by the end of the episode, we're, we're down to just one dumb kid again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go talk about this week's episode. When we open up, whose boat is this? It's like the bat boat like, <laughs> going down <laughs> Miami. Paul and asked you Miami. It eventually comes up to the dock. It stops. You see Sonny is watching from the dock. So you see it's really easy to spot his speedboat, which we actually haven't seen that much in this season. I was just going to say that. What do you think? They like lost the boat or something? They're like, we don't have the boat. We, we don't have the right have to use the boat. <laughs> I have a sneaking suspicion that this is going to become his boat after this. Uh, <laughs> after uh, they confiscate vice... that one. <laughs> yes. Typical vice bust fashion. It immediately starts as a shootout because, I mean, why just why not? Why arrest him when you can just shoot him? <laughs> At the same time, a man in a helicopter with a terrible, terrible British accent, which I hoped was not going to make a reappearance in the episode, but it ends up being a you know pretty important part of the story, is watching from mm -hmm. the helicopter. All I can think about is that our teenage daughter keeps doing <laughs> English. Her and her friends do an English accent for fun. And they're better than what this guy <laughs> <Yes>. was doing. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what I'm wondering is, is how come the bad guy has a helicopter but Vice doesn't? I feel like a helicopter could have been helpful. Sonny shoots one man, still shoot out with him and Tubbs, dealing with the other two. They're able to get away, throw, steal someone's truck, throw their drugs into the back of the truck and drive away. So, and which is interesting because our British man named Ross also isn't able to follow the truck. You think he'd be able to follow that really easily in that helicopter as he sees the truck mm -hmm. and the men run away, but you know. He's British, he can't fly a helicopter. <laughs> Everything about this old truck being the getaway car and them getting away is just ridiculous because like this is a bust guys like there's not cops waiting out cop cars how did they get away in a 1954 ford whatever <laughs> you know tubs and crockett come up on the person's shot so they took one down two got away sonny is heartbroken because he sees that the guy's really young and this is a point that I'm going to hammer right here. Sunny is getting Sunny more kills and more. Kids. <laughs> Sunny is getting more and more personal when it comes to these shootings. He's taking them more personal. He is more heartbroken over these types of things. Sunny season two, he's like, yeah, he's young, but that but that person deserved it. Sunny season five, oh my god, this person's just a kid, only a twenty year old kid. I can't do this for much longer. Yeah, exactly. He's definitely changed his opinion on murdering young kids <laughs> <laughs> i guess what i'm getting at is that these types of things are weighing on him more and more the job he's not able to just let the job slide off of him like he was doing before he carries it with him now yeah he carries a lot of guilt deep down good inside for stuff he does for the job yeah yeah exactly good thing there's a therapist in this episode <laughs> and then we go to the opening credits this is our moment to check in with the guest stars. And John, I took a quick glance at the guest stars for this episode, and it's like 37 people. I have a feeling it's because a lot of them have appeared in Vice before. 
What do you got for us this week? Okay, so we'll just start at the top. We're going to start with Robert Joy, who plays uh, the ridiculous, evil Sebastian Ross in this episode. <laughs> he's a Canadian actor, and he's most uh, no- <laughs> notably... <laughs> he's not even British. Oh, I knew he, there was no way he could be British. <laughs> Canadian. You would think being Canadian, he could at least fake a British accent. Like, think there's enough there. But he's best known for his role as Dr. Sid Hammerback was on CSI New York, which uh, would feature him in 168 episodes. So, uh, so yeah, he was on one of those CSI shows. Also played Lizard in The Hills Have Eyes. And he played uh, Jim in Desperately Seeking Susan. And a few other movies, a few other fantastic movies he was in death wish five the faith face of death uh water world the best of all of the kevin costner flicks <laughs> he was in a bunch of tv movies he also popped up in an episode as with a guest appearance in an episode of nash bridges well at least what i know him from one episode of crossing jordan <laughs> That's right. It's coming up in every show now. <laughs> Let's keep moving on. So we have Daniel Villarreal, who plays Lewis Woods in this episode. At times, I will say, like, this person was in this movie and this person was in this movie. Just because I list the uh, movie and it's a big movie doesn't necessarily mean that they actually had more than, like, one line to say in the movie. He was in Stand and Deliver, American Me, Speed, Matchstick Men and Dead Man on Campus. Now, yeah. preference that by him playing mostly like waiter, cop number two. <laughs> but like these aren't the giant roles. Although Dan and Deliver was his first job in Hollywood. He was a production assistant and it would also end up being his first uh, acting part as well. He would, I mean, I think his biggest role was in Speed where he played the character of Ray, who was just one of the people on the bus. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I kept wondering what I remembered him from, and it was it's from Speed. <laughs> so moving on, we've got Justin Lazard as Metro Day Detective Joey. Uh, what uh, used to be... Okay, he was Joey Harden, <laughs> EA agent, in episode In the Line of Fire. He's now playing the exact same character, except they changed his surname to Chandler. So now he's <laughs> Metro Day Detective Joey Chandler, but he's the same kid. Same character. So all we can assume is that Joey Harden got married. (laughs) So congratulations, Justin, Justin, on the fake marriage. We've talked about him before, and we will see him again. So I'm not going to focus too much time here. So we're not going to talk about him anymore. (laughs) No, we're not going to talk about him. We're not going to. Come on, Vice. Like, like, why did you change his last? Never mind. Our (laughs) next person, (laughs) guest stars, is Paul Provenza. He plays Ricky DeMarie. He was a TV pre- presenter, actor, comedian, radio panelist, and filmmaker. And he would seem from afar as someone that, like, you wouldn't really recognize. Because he's actually done some kind of pretty big stuff. So he started out, he got into acting in college, and his first appearance was doing stand-up on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. He would then host a short-lived nor- Nickelodeon show called Kids Court. He would... Follow that up, playing the character of Patrick on the show Empty Nest, and the character Dr. Phil uh, Capra in uh, season six of the TV show Northern Exposure. Actually, a couple pretty big parts there as far as TV goes. He'd also do some stage work and appear on a bunch of podcasts, including Mark Maron's. What we're going to know him most for is he would, in the 2000s, find a new calling as a director, and in 2005, with Penn Gillette, and direct the uh, documentary, The Aristocrats. Oh, my. Our next guest star is Conrad Roberts. He plays Police Commissioner Henry Wilford, or Williford. We'll see him again. He pops up in another episode, uh, but just in short, he began his career in 68, playing Edward Stark on the TV show The Doctors. He would do that for 100 episodes, and somehow, amazingly, leave in 1969 a year later. 100 episodes in a year. Like, damn. He, so, then literally his biography would say, and then he would spend 15 years appearing in various film productions. <laughs> Isn't a great endorsement for those film productions. <laughs> Peter Nelson is our next guest star. He plays Dan Shaw. He's an American actor, best known for his e- role as the evil visitor youth leader Brian in NBC's 1983 miniseries V and 84's <laughs> sequel, V, the final battle. 
think I think that's like the Roman numeral for five. But, uh, very similar to our second guest star. He was in some bigger movies, but not not necessarily in big roles. He was in Purple Haze in 83, The Last Starfighter in 84, the original The Expendables in 89, Die Hard 2 in 90, and Double Team in 97, which is the Jean-Claude Van Damme... Uh, the twin one, where uh, they're the, twins. No, no, no that's the basketball the, player. The, no, the yeah, one with the... Dennis Rodman. Here Dennis Rodman, yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, obviously... Me and Melissa are two of the uh, two of all two of the two fans of that movie. <laughs> <laughs> but his most recent film is a sci-fi movie, a sci-fi network movie called Shark Sharktopus, and he filmed that under the stage name Calvin Person, person <laughs> with two S's. You see, Peter Neslin. Uh, apparently, Shark Top Shark. Uh, Sharktopus is not Peter Nelson uh, quality, so you get Calvin Person <laughs> instead. All right, so our second to last guest stars Jane Hines. She plays the psychiatrist. She doesn't even get a uh, character name. She was an actress and casting director. She was an actress in movies Born on the Fourth of July, Joe vs. the Volcano and Awakenings. And once again, big name movies. Not so big parts, but now she's a casting director, so I imagine she does well for herself. Finally, our big guest star of the episode, Rita Moreno, who plays Congresswoman Madeline Woods. She's a Puerto Rican actress, dancer, and singer. She's done some huge movies. She was in the original film, The King and I. She was in Singing in the Rain. Her career spans 70 years. I mean, she has gone from like some of the most classic movies to affecting my childhood providing the voice of Carmen Sandiego for Fox's 90s animated series. Uh, she was a regular on the TV show 9 to 5. She played Sister Pete on HBO's Oz. She said, Elvis was not a good lover, and I believe her. I don't. <laughs> but most importantly, of all of that, she is one of the few people to have ever egotted. Egot, of course, a term coined by Philip Michael Thomas almost <laughs> at the exact time this episode was filmed in which he was on the Tonight Show appearance and coined the term, saying that he wanted to achieve it. That was his goal. He never did. Not even close. Didn't win a single uh, award. <laughs> Not an, Emmy, one of them. <laughs> not an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, or a Tony. Not for lack of trying, because he has done productions and stage productions in movies and TV shows and music. He has tried. <laughs> but Rita Moreno, Rita Moreno accomplished this. She got her Emmy, uh, one of her Emmys, in 1977, The Muppet Show for Emmy for Outstanding Performance in Variety or Music. She won a Grammy for Best Album for Children with the Electric Company album in 1972, which she was part, she was on the PVS TV show. She got her Oscar for Best Supporting Actress in her 1961 portrayal in West, in the original West Side Story. And she won her Tony Best Feature Actress in the 1975 production, The Ritz. She achieved uh, the EGOT. I think the Vice, maybe Vice brought her on to try and inspire Michael Thomas. <laughs> Wait a minute. She EGOTed before <laughs> Philip Michael Thomas even said that was a thing. Yeah, before. She had yeah. already done it before this appearance. In fact, maybe she inspired him making up the term because it was right around this time when she appeared on the program that he was on the Tonight Show and he coined the term. So He's maybe like, she inspired him. I'm better than her. <laughs> Uh-huh. Come on, she got one of those Muppet show. Like, come on, I can do this. <laughs> Never did. Not a single award. <laughs> he didn't even get the first step of it. <laughs> when we come back from the opening credits, we're at a restaurant, and Castillo is meeting with Commissioner Henry Williford. Now, Henry has a very particular way to speak in which he speaks. Speak. <laughs> It's like, speed it up, Henry. I ain't got all morning for this breakfast. <laughs> Feels more like a brunt to me. But... Henry thinks very highly of himself. Like, I've accomplished this, and I have a good relationship with Congresswoman Woods. And Henry also says that a man that was killed in the shootout worked on Woods' campaign. Castillo says, yeah, uh, you know, he kind of figured that out. While you were talking, we had enough time <laughs> in between the words. Yeah, because he was like, he's like wolfing down his omelet. And he's like, yeah, uh, like I know. Like, what does this matter to me? Like, like, <laughs> I'm over Henry's, here eating an omelet. Like, come on. Henry says, you should be 
Congresswoman <laughs> Woods, her integrity is unmatched. <laughs> So then we go to the precinct and Sonny is there on the phone. He's trying to back out of having to go to therapy. He's telling the therapist, I got a court case. I got important stuff to do. She is having none of that. She's like, you agreed to yeah. do this to keep your job, Sonny. Oh, well, why didn't you say that earlier? I'll be there at two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and he seems so upset. It's going to be a three hour, no holds, hard session. Just him and his feelings. Let me tell you something, brother. <laughs> when you go to that therapist room and a thousand Hulkamaniacs come rushing up on you, what are you going to do? <laughs> I will say this, uh, I was distracted during the whole scene. What is with the toy grad helicopters on their desk? It's their emergency room helicopters that for taking Castillo from the crime scene <laughs> to the hospital. <laughs> Castillo comes in, he says they have a preliminary report. The men are de definitely work for Ross. And they're dead. They're definitely and, and dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and breakfast was lovely. The dead kid ran with someone named De Maria, who was only 19, and none of them are young enough for a looks wise to be able to infiltrate the de maria gang stan tries to say well i'll get some acne i can a joke you know i'll be able to infiltrate it and sonny says no i know a guy and i stopped like i froze he like, knows a kid i froze yeah. oh my god i think i know who he's talking about please god no let it don't be this person <laughs> We go to the docks. And real, there he is. <laughs> real fast, we go to the docks. Ross is taking, uh, is talking to Morales, one, one, one of the men that is working for him that was overseeing this drug trade. And uh, he's not too happy with them, but he does like his dog, Edwina. Yeah, and we also find out that our villain in this episode is some kind of Sherlock Holmes Bond villain, <laughs> like some kind of mix between the two. <laughs> He's the most stereotypical Englishman ever, right? Except for, I think they wear, they wear their suits like four times too big for them. He looks like he's wearing his dad's suit. <laughs> Why is this dog walker with him all the time? I don't know. Why can't he leave poor Edwina at home? <laughs> Edwina looks like she's she's getting up there in age. Like she probably shouldn't be doing this much traveling. <laughs> I can't imagine riding helicopters is good for her. At Congresswoman Woods's house. So she lives on like a yacht or something, right? I don't like that, know. I guess she does. Yeah. It's like a secret boat meeting. <laughs> <laughs> she's watching herself on TV give a press conference about, I think it's just about her general re election. I don't get the point she's trying to make, though, because she's saying <laughs> when the administration started, kilos were 50K uh, <laughs> and now they're, and now they're $10,000. <laughs> and I'm thinking, like, well, I mean, that's a discount. Like, that's a good thing. Like, <laughs> They're cheaper now. <laughs> that's what Dominic said. He goes, she made drugs cheaper. That's what she achieved. But why that's good, we don't know while we were watching it. Fire sale while Woods is <laughs> on the case. Everything must go. Black, it's Black Friday every day. Yeah. Thanks to Congresswoman yes. Woods. She's talking to Dan, who's her aide, like her number one campaign. Yeah, she's aide, in yeah. charge of the campaign. And he's giving her some coaching and then whoop, whoop. And then Williford and Castillo come walking in to get an introduction. Castillo gets to meet the congresswoman. Woods says, I can't believe one of my people was involved. I just, you know, that would I would never be okay with so something like that. By the way, do you have any info on the case? I'd love to have some inside information. Castillo's like, you know who you're talking oh, to? Oh, yeah. I don't even tell my mom stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. They're like all trying to be all sly about it. Like, like, like we pinky swear we won't tell, you know? And then she like, drops that line where she kind of like says like, hey, I'm kind of your boss. Like, you should probably tell me. Even Williford's like, don't be so uptight. <laughs> <laughs> so then we go from there and we see Sonny. He's mm -hmm. driving and I'm getting nervous. My palms are getting sweaty. <laughs> Comes driving up, he stops. From, from the no boat meeting to the bridge meeting. <laughs> There's no shoulder. He just stops like in the middle of the road. Yeah, that was very strange. He gets out, he comes walking up. God damn it, Joey Harden, you son of a bitch. <laughs> you survived? <laughs> You're here to ruin Joey Chandler episode. now, he got married. <laughs> <laughs> Joey is excited to work with Vice. Ask if it's going to be undercover. Like, uh huh, wink, wink. Do I need to put some more Pepsi inside of my cereal? <laughs> Dude. <laughs> Sonny explains the case, and then Joey starts practicing. Sonny stops him and says, You got to be more cool, man. You got to sell yourself, get lost in the role. Also, you want them to want to be you, man. <laughs> it was very, very cliched. <laughs> so, after we leave from Joey, we see there's two men 
that are on the phone. One of them is Lewis. Two men are on the phone. They're the ones that got away with Ross's drugs. One is Lewis, and he's really nervous. And he's saying, Ross is going to find out, and then we're going to be dead. This is terrible. We should just give him back his drugs. Morales would say that the drugs are on the beach. And that's what De Maria, De Maria is trying to say. It's like, they're never going to be able to trace it back to us. The cops took it in the raid. They they got the drugs. So what's on us? He has the worst sales pitch. Oh, yeah, relax, man. He's never going to come looking for his drugs. Uh, not like they're expensive at all. Or <laughs> <laughs> They're only $10,000 a kilo now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, super cheap. <laughs> Dan Maria goes downstairs and he meets with Joey, who comes over, who's sitting at the bar. It's like a weird bar. It looks like like someone's serving out of a bathroom and they knocked a hole in the wall. It's very weird <laughs> and dirty looking. <laughs> <laughs> and Joey, man, he's just terrible at this undercover stuff. He comes over, starts trying to do, hey, do you have any, you know, white stuff? And they have him and this guy have this weird conversation where I don't think either one of them knew exactly what the other one was talking about. <laughs> but somehow it kind of works out. I just think the whole time, like, God damn it, Joey, ruin another episode. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Uh, <laughs> Later, De Maria goes down and meets with Ross. Sorry, he like goes upstairs like to his office and he sees that Ross is there. And De Maria is like, I, Who are you? Why are you in my office slash bathroom? And I think that's his apartment. Is it? Yeah, I, that's I just like where he lives. Yeah, so it's like it's got, got to be some flop house, right? That he runs where pe- people are doing drugs there, and then they also have like a bar downstairs yep, and stuff exactly like that. Okay. Ross says that yeah. De Maria is just a thief. He has his drugs. You should turn him over. And De Maria's like, no, I don't got anything. Ross gives him a light caning, and De Maria's like, okay. I'm sorry. Yes, we did steal your drugs, but I'm sorry. Oh, it, and I don't have them anymore. Uh, uh, and, it, the, and this is awesome. Because we get, we have the cutest attack dog. He's kind of old and drooly and everything. And you don't think like the, you know, you think he like he's just there to kind of. But then he turns to him in like Scooby Doo fashion. Where are the drugs? And the dog, I don't know, Waggy, and kind of does <laughs> waves his nose over there, and magically the drugs fall from the ceiling where the dog <laughs> points it out. He finds it so easy, and then he gives. Dan Maria, another light caning. He goes, another guy has the other half of the drugs. <laughs> I'll tell you who that is, too. Yes. Oh, no. Then, yeah. then after some light tasering, then he tells him. <laughs> Which it would figure that a British villain would be armed with a taser. Usually in these vice stories, the American villains, they're shooting people with. No, our British villain is caning people and and tasering them <laughs> even later joey comes back with tubs i imagine it's supposed to be like a cooper deal that was going to happen for a whole bunch of drugs but they find De maria dead and also brushing him off like he's covered in drugs like he's dusty yeah he's like covered his whole face body's covered in it yeah tub says it looks like he had a tea session <laughs> ross <laughs> and then also that there's two <laughs> paychecks from morales so they can see like they're all linked together like Ross and Morales and De Maria, like everyone's kind of working together here. Convenient he pays them in check form. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I thought they'd be like criminals would pay in cash, so you can't link you two together, but you know, hey, what do I know about criminal activities? <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to go to Sonny's first therapy session, and he's not handling it very well. It's about as you would expect. Right out of the gate, he tells the therapist that she's a crook, and also she's like an interrogator against the Viet Cong. Let's face it, she's not a very good therapist. She doesn't not even she doesn't really care about anything he's saying. <laughs> also, what the hell is with her office? Why does she have like all those weird furniture where it's like you can sit on one side and he, he she's sitting on one side and he's on the other and she's got like her legs up on the couch? Like what the <laughs> hell is going on? Why is it her office so big? Like therapist making the money. That's what Sunny's saying. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. In a roundabout way, Sonny eventually gets to that he'll never be comfortable with who he is or what he's done. That he has has to no matter what therapy he does he still has to live with the fact that he's killed all these people that he's done these things that he's seen other people do these atrocious things and just because he can be okay with himself doesn't mean he's ever going to be okay with any of that stuff or what he's done as being a vice cop not including i was gonna say sonny shouldn't, burnett shouldn't it be weighing on him what he did when he was sonny burnett <laughs> <laughs> when he actually murdered people there was no justification just murdered <laughs> If there was anything in this episode as a takeaway, it's these therapy sessions. 
Because you really get an insight to where Sonny's head is. He doesn't like his job anymore. It's tearing him up from the inside. And he's he is not the same person he was before he was Burnett. I think he doesn't like himself he, anymore. That's like the key. He doesn't like he doesn't like who he is. He doesn't like what he does. He doesn't believe in it anymore. Change his name to Nash Bridges. <laughs> <laughs> the therapy sessions for me, he tried so hard to get out of it, talked so much crap about it, but he clearly enjoys it. This is just the first one. The second one, he's just gushing to her at that point. Seems like he likes therapy a lot more than he first indicated. Maybe he should have been in therapy a lot longer. Much longer ago. Quick scene on the street. Ross Ben kidnapped Lewis. At the shooting range, Woods is there with her aide, Dan, and he wants her to learn how to shoot. And he says that, you know, the feminist agenda thing isn't going to work out for you anymore. And she says, I'm not going to be some right wing macho agenda. I'm not going to pander to them. And then right then, Ross walks in. He pulls out his gun and shoots the target and makes like a shape of like a smiley face on the target and then introduces his crew woods is obviously shocked He's like what the who the hell are you and why are you here and how did you even get in here boss says i got your your boy here lewis your actual son and he's been selling drugs since he stole some drugs from me and i can't get the information out of him so i'm hoping you his mom can get some information out of him by the way, if you're not able to get the information and my drugs, I'm going to ruin your political career. This scene kind of laid out. So we've we've already we've been joking a lot about our British Spawn villain here, but this is just another weird scene. After you know the feminist banter, when he comes walking out, he starts by introducing his dog walker Maury. He tells him <laughs> that he wants his drugs back, and then she starts to like get upset. She's like, "I don't want to hear it," and he almost gets upset. Like, "Are you sure you don't want to hear my explanation?" Like, I explain things very well <laughs> and then at the very end of the scene he after he basically threatens her he then asks her for to go to tea with them like like what the hell's going on here yeah what's going on here ross can shoot straight here tell us exactly what it is that you want what says she's not interested Ross says that the Maria is dead and Lewis is next if you don't help him. So now, you know, she's trying to play like I'm not going to be bullied, but obviously, like, she's going to get something done here. So now at a helipad, Lewis is trying to ask her for help. And he says, Mommy, your career was always first. You would never take care of me. And Woods lays into him. In fact, she eviscerates him so bad. I was apologizing and asking Mommy to calm down. <laughs> He does the spoiled rich kid. I do this because of you, mom. And and she was like, listen here, you spoiled little brat. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I kind of get where she's coming from with this. This little bastard's creating all kinds of trouble for her. She destroys him. She obliterates him. And by the end of it, he's like, mom, just please help me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She basically talks about how she had to sacrifice all this stuff to get her career and how she was a woman. And what, she's like one of the only women in that industry. And she did it all with him, but as a burden, basically still being a good mom and taking care of him. But he was like a burden to take care of. Is what yeah. she's trying to say. I should have listened to Marlon. She says, I need time to think about it. Gets on a helicopter and leaves. <laughs> At the therapist, Sonny is still blabbing on and on. And then the therapist finally asks, like, so what about your private life? He says, I don't have a private life. I'm a junkie for the action. I I work 24-7. I don't ever stop. I don't stop for anything. I, don't I have was never life. married. I don't have any kids. <laughs> I was never too closely involved with a meat fondler. <laughs> he continues. In the beginning, he thought he could make a difference. with the, And the vice team was so full of energy. And he lists off everyone except for Zito. Yeah, ouch. And then he says... I don't believe in the work anymore. I don't believe I can make a difference anymore. It's not, it's, he says, it's not for me. I'm, I'm done. I'm done as a police officer. Yeah, that's exactly what he says. At Woods's boat, she's now having lunch with Castillo again. She's apologizing for how she behaved before when they first met. And oh, by the way, I he's know having an awesome week. <laughs> he's having such an awesome. First, someone first the police commissioner buys him breakfast. Now she's feeding him lunch. He's used to just leftover Thai food. Like this is awesome. <laughs> she also says, "Hey, I happen to know when 250 keys are coming in too." 
Thought you might want to know. Yeah, just, you know, <laughs> randomly I know that. Mm -hmm. So, hell yeah, Castillo was interested. Let's party. <laughs> <laughs> he asked her how she got the info. I was like, I can't share with you, but here's all the information that you need. And he repeats it back. They shake hands. He leaves. Th this next scene, I swear to God, when it started, I thought this was a vice bust. And I was like, man, they're just getting lazy. <laughs> just going to drive in and open fire. <laughs> Mow everyone down. <laughs> like they're not even trying anymore. <laughs> Drugs come in. Team is offloading them. That group of cars pulls up, unloads on them, then steals their drugs and drives away. But an awesome mustache man is up on the roof and he's watching the entire thing. Very confused by the look on his face. <laughs> <laughs> when the police show up and the vice team is there, you hear the mustache man when Castillo shows up. Says, that's the man that was in the limo. That's him. I'll recognize him anywhere. Setting Castillo up. But, yeah, as I say, the man that was in the limo did not look like him, just so we know. <laughs> he had black hair and a mustache. Uh -huh. That was where it went. That was it. That was the extent of it. Meanwhile, Switek is getting Morales drunk. <laughs> Super drunk. Like, and, and not only is he getting them drunk, but he's actually doing, like, Doing it for police work, like actual police work is being done. <laughs> Dwight Tech comes and pretty much solves, breaks the case. So, but yeah, he's getting him drunk. He gets him drunk on McCarty 151. They go out and look at the moon when Morales describes that the moon is like an orange pie. That's <laughs> he's <thing>. drunk. No. <laughs> Joey inside finds a picture of Lewis and De Maria together. And that's when Stan takes it back to the precinct later and shows it to Tubbs and Gina. Here's Congresswoman Wood's son with the drug dealer that we found dead. He is clearly linked up with Ross. Now it looks like Ross is doing business with Morales, who has Lewis on his payroll, so Ross must be have, have a direct line to Woods. Gina says Castillo is meeting with Woods right now. The tub says, wait, hold on a second. Castillo was set up. No credible witnesses. No one was injured. This is clearly a setup. So they run off to go help Castillo. <laughs> At Woods' house, Castillo hears a tape of him, of what's supposed to be him on the phone setting up the drug deal, but it's just what he had repeated back to Woods earlier at lunch but it's been cut and she's into not, a conversation and she's not very good at this whole criminal thing she's all nervous and like she's trying to apologize about setting him up while she's setting him up and she says i'm not gonna send you to jail just resign peacefully you don't even have to be here anymore she does not know Castillo's him well like, does she <laughs> <laughs> yeah because he was like this stinks of sebastian ross and then the worst <laughs> thing that could ever happen happens <laughs> in the hallway dan is listening to the whole conversation he does not like the direction that it's going see him like biting his hand and pumping his fist <laughs> he pulls out a gun wood starts breaking down she's flipping out on castillo saying i'm not involved with anyone she looks like she's finally going to crack because castillo saying it's gonna be easy to pick out that this was a setup the guns they used on before the drug bust were all British guns. So it's like, it's clear that some other gang was the one that was overseeing this. And that's when Dan's had enough. He comes in and shoots Castillo and then goes over to Woods and says, I've invested too much time in you. We're going to plant two kilos on him and then play the tape. But just then the duo come busting in and they handcuff Dan, not Woods. Just Dan. And they see that Castillo was in bad shape. So Tubbs calls 911 while Sonny hugs Castillo on the ground. And tries to kiss his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we get to the hospital, he's being rushed in. And you know that, you know, the team's franicking. They're, they're telling him, get him the best foot doctor you got. <laughs> they do not have a dermatologist available. So... <laughs> They need a podiatrist, okay? <laughs> a nurse comes in very nonchalantly and says, he's alive, but he's critical. I got to go. Yeah. Maybe he'll <laughs> live. Maybe he won't. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, she was so... She sounded like she was annoyed she had to be there. She's like, whatever. I tried. It went to a... Like, shattered his spine or something. I don't know. I don't know if he's okay or not. <laughs> it's my break. Leave me alone. <laughs> Stan says that the tape that they made of the Castillo conversation is perfect. Like, they can't prove that it's a fake so they have no reason except to clear castillo's name by bringing down woods and having her confess to what happened so they run off to so woods of course house. they go storming into her yacht you know which seems more difficult than it would appear <laughs> so and they they do what they always do they threaten to arrest her kid so basically the drug dealer threatened to kill her kid. They're threatening to arrest her kid. Everybody's just blackmailing Woods at this point. Tubbs is like, we know your son's a chump. 
We're going to bring him down just like that chump Morales. Everyone's a chump. <laughs> Morales said Lewis was running the drugs and Morales has a picture of her son. So what's up? What's up, what's Congresswoman? Up that? <laughs> <laughs> so they go back to the precincts and they've brought Lewis in. And he's trying to act cool and be like, you ain't got nothing on me. You can't scare me. And Sonny's trying to threaten him with, hey, look, if Castillo dies, you'll be my only thing I will pay attention to in my entire life. I will hound you every day to pin you down as a drug killer. A drug killer. As a cop killer. <laughs> A drug killer. <laughs> also, only if he dies, not for just shooting him normally. Like, I mean, he can yeah, be really hurt. Yeah. <laughs> I won't get mad at yeah, well, that. <laughs> but of course, Lewis is, is scared. You know, I mean, why wouldn't he? Uh, he's being threatened by a a British villain. Like, <laughs> you don't know what that's like. Have, have you never watched a Bond flick? He's going to end up being strapped down to a table with a laser coming at him or something like <laughs> these guys don't play around. Woods comes in and says, I've changed my mind. We'll cooperate. I will give you all the information that I can. Lewis flips out and says, you're crazy. Ross is going to kill me. And Woods says, no, you won't. Vice will protect you. Right, Sonny? And Sonny's like, yeah, of course. And then I wrote down, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> all those even even Joey barely survived protection <laughs> from vice. Yeah, he was a DEA agent. I mean, not a very good one, but he was pretty, a DEA agent. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the last step of becoming a Navy SEAL is going under a vice protection. If you survive, that's the, when you, yeah, you exactly. become a Navy SEAL. Uh -huh. Lewis says there's no way to stop Ross, but Woods says, we're going to make this work. Whatever it is, it is. Sam comes in and says, Castillo wants to see Sonny. He's awake now. He wants to see Sonny. Everyone else, you guys keep doing your job. <laughs> he doesn't like you people. <laughs> the team is going to put a wire on Woods, of course, and have her go talk to Ross, of course, get him to say something incriminating, and then take him down without any backup. That that seems like it's flawless. That's flawless yeah, logic. That's that is how Vice mm -hmm. does everything. And they're so good at protecting people. What could go wrong? <laughs> is it weird that when she shows up at Ross's house, I feel like he had just finished making like a lovely salmon paired with delicious Chardonnay or something. <laughs> <laughs> she comes in and tells Ross that Castillo has died. And Ross says, oh, well, I mean, we'll give Dan the best lawyers that money can buy. So he should be OK. Uh, things happen. Ross's assistant, and then, Murray, brings dog in walker. Edwina. He's a dog walker. <laughs> yeah on their walk because he's a dog walker just then as edwina comes in and sits down and ross is explaining why he was going to kill castillo because he was driving up prices and and was costing him money her wire starts to whistle i think or is it whistle because she puts her hand over it big debate there was it whistling before she put her hand on it or did she put her hand over it and it caused it to whistle see i think the dog was the one who caused it to whistle because he knew it was a trap from the get-go <laughs> dog immediately knew like hey this is a trap but no one ever listens to the dog i do want to point out us still fantastic at, at explaining things <laughs> Edwina looks at Woods because he can she can hear the whistle of the microphone. Ross pulls back her lapel and sees the wire, pulls out his gun, grabs her, and he's gonna shoot her, but just then Tubbs and uh Stan, Stan. come busting in. They shoot Ross's assistant and then dog down. Yeah. Edwina Dude! <laughs> Oh, dude, this is not only do they just come in and start firing at them while he while Ross has Woods as a hostage. So with complete disregard to the hostage, to the congresswoman's life, they just start firing and they hit the the innocent dog who is just <laughs> an innocent bystander in all of this. Like, I, just and it's and you know, it's Tubbs, too, because White Tech gets the assistant guy. But Tubbs, I, I don't think Tubbs likes dogs. <laughs> Let's preface this with any background noise you've ever heard in this podcast has been John's dogs. So John, as I was watching this episode, when I saw that Avina had got hit, I imagine that when John saw it, you know, 2,500 miles away in Seattle, he got out his Glock 9, put on his John Wick <laughs> suit and was going to go get some revenge. But he was buried under Damn two dogs, right. so he couldn't get up. <laughs> Damn right. Vice having to go shoot the dog right before the end of the episode. <laughs> dog was the only character I liked. <laughs> Ross immediately stops trying to like hold Woods hostage. 
He just collapses when he sees that his dog has been shot, asking them, be- begging them to please call an ambulance and to come like, save his dog. <laughs> <laughs> and that was he's calling an- somebody call an ambulance. The dog needs an emergency vet now. We can deal all the legal stuff up later. We'll figure it out later. Someone get this. You look how fast they got Castillo to the hospital to a dermatologist. <laughs> I would argue that you don't, uh, what, you, what can't, was it? you can't take a dog in an ambulance. I hate to tell you this. As much as I love dogs, they will an ambulance will not take your dog. <laughs> They've got they. There's a Ferrari. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry. He uh, Crockett wasn't there. I can't say that. <laughs> Pup's got a big car. He's got a convertible. Load the him in the convertible. Van. Let's go. <laughs> Take him in the bug van. We fade out. Yeah. And then when we fade back in, we're at the hospital. And Melissa, you were, you were saying that you anticipated Edwina to be laying in the hospital <laughs> bed next to Castillo. And there she is on life support. <laughs> Sonny comes in and tells Castillo that the doc said he's going to be okay. Castillo's like, yeah, I know. He shouldn't have gone by himself. He was stupid to go by himself. And Sonny says, "What? that's what I would have done. And Castillo's like, because you're stupid. Because we're stupid. <laughs> Castillo says he kept thinking about how, how he sounded on the tape and what other people on the vice team would think yeah. of him. Hearing that, thinking that he's dirty. And Sonny says, there's no way, man. Like, we would never think that about you. You're the glue of this team. We're a team. We trust you. We all trust each other. There's no way that any of us would ever believe that you would try and set up a drug deal. There's no way, man. Like, we're all here in this together. And then we freeze frame, and that's the end of the care. episode. I don't care about any about that. What happened to the dog? Is the dog okay? <laughs> Someone let me know. I hate you, Vice. <laughs> I have lots of final thoughts about how this episode ended and the <laughs> tone that it set in that hospital scene. And Edwina. <laughs> I, do, I do too. And a lot of them end in, in nasty letters I'm going to be sending <laughs> to. <laughs> Dear so-and-so, I love your wieners. <laughs> you leave me out of this, Melissa. <laughs> Just because I wrote one time to a company about why asking them why they discontinued their hot dogs. <laughs> I'm sorry. But there is no other. <laughs> you can't get over that. Right, one time about hot dogs. You never let it go. Anyways, this episode ends. That is a hint at what's to come in these final episodes of the season. So I don't want to talk more about that. Nothing about wieners. But... More dog shooting? <laughs> John, don't look. Don't watch any more of the episodes, John. No, no. I'm gonna have to have someone watch the episode ahead of time and screen it for dog violence. <laughs> but before we get to the final thoughts, let's go take a look at this week's music. We actually have some new bands, so let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John. Like I mentioned, we actually have two bands you've never talked about before, which is a total 180 from what happened last week, where the music guests included. Someone who was the only music in an episode. What do you got for us this week? Thankfully, we've got some original artists. Stephen Moore, what was fantastic too, this is the only time I will have to talk about them so we can actually just talk about them and I won't have to try and make up something later. <laughs> we start out with Working On It by Chris Ray or Rhea. He's a British rock and blues singer and, singer and songwriter. He's known for his husky, gravelly voice and his slide guitar playing. Slide guitar, sign me up. <laughs> He's one of seven kids. He's from Middlesbrough. Uh, and the actually, the, the Rhea or Ray or, or whatever you pronounce his, his last name, actually kind of famous in that area for Camilio's Ice Cream Factory and Cafe Chain, which his family owns. Ice so, cream too? <laughs> yeah, ice cream factory and cafe chain. And he actually did, thought about not going into music. He was going to work in the family ice cream factory, which, I mean, <laughs> doesn't seem too bad. He ended up going into music at age 21 or 22. He bought his first guitar, and this was in 1961. So he actually got kind of a late start in music. He, uh, he, he claimed to be self-taught, and he almost joined his friend's band at the time called the Elastic band but his dad convinced him that it wasn't that they weren't going to pay him enough money and talked him into coming back to the old ice cream family factory (laughs) ice cream that's where the money's at not music 
Exactly. Eventually, by 1973, he would join a band called Magdalene, uh, and the lineup would include David Coverdale, who would later be a member of Deep Purple. Pretty quickly, he took over writing their songs, eventually singing as their singer just kind of stopped showing up. (laughs) So he would go on from there and form his own band called The Beautiful Losers in 1975. They would receive Melody Maker's Best New Newcomers Award, and even though it may not have lasted with the band, it did help him help him secure his first solo record deal. He would sign with Magnet Records, and ultimately, the Beautiful Losers would split up in 1977. But in 1978, he would release his debut album, What Happened to Benny Santini, which would have his first single, Fool, If You Think It's Over, which is actually like his biggest hit. It would peak. At number 12 in the U.S., one of his only songs to really chart in the U.S. on the Hot 100, and would be number one in adult contemporary singles. Also happens to be the only song that he did not play guitar on. Take him a few years to get back to his uh, blues roots, and then by 1983, he would start to find success in Europe and in the U.K., but not really break th- but he wouldn't break through to the U.S. again for a while. From 83 to 2000, he just released albums, and all of his albums were pretty successful, selling, you know, millions of copies like a lot of stories about stars just because he was selling millions of records doesn't mean he made a bunch of money he'd actually find out and fire his manager when he found out his manager was making more money than he was off his music and it would take him from 83 to 87 to finally pay off 320 thousand pounds of debt uh, to and actually start generating significant revenue because of how his record contract was and, and stuff with touring he was actually in debt until the 87 he had to release like four albums and sell like a few million records before he actually started making money damn And you know what's crazy is that there are so many stories that are like that, too. Luckily for him, that he would continue to be relevant, this song in particular, working on it, that was released on 1988's New Light Through Old Windows, would be his first song to chart in the U.S. in a frickin' decade. His next album, uh, The Road to Hell in 89, would be massive in the U.K. Things would get better for him financially, and he, he would continue to go on. His 93 album, Expresso Logic, not only hit the top 10 in the UK, but it was promoted in part with uh, Rhea taking part in the British Touring Car Championship. Now, ultimately, he'd be eliminated in the first round, but this wouldn't be the only time. Uh, It turns out he's a big Formula one enthusiast uh so like he's written songs for for like for like their opens and stuff and he's also shown up in in a couple pits of a few drivers as well in 2000 he would be diagnosed with actually pancreatic cancer Mm. so he he, you know his music career would kind of come to a halt his pancreas would be removed and he'd actually end up returning to performing he still has has had has medical issues from what it looks like they removed all, most or all of the cancer wow he would continue touring and releasing music until 2016 when he would have a stroke and well since stroke it's made things pretty difficult 2017 was his last stage appearance he collapsed on stage his last few shows have been canceled so we wish you the best chris by the way, what's kind of ironic with the with the whole cancer thing, only real film credit as far as an actor came in the 1999 comedy film Parting Shots, in which he played a character who uh, went out and got revenge after being diagnosed with cancer. But he's still he's still trying to do it. Our next artist is Tackhead with the song Hard Left. Gotta love a band name called Tackhead. (laughs) I knew you were going to be all over that one. They're not just known as Tackhead, sometimes known as Fats Comet. (laughs) Come on, guys. Let's talk about the industrial rap game from the 80s and early 90s. (laughs) Tackhead's core members were made up of Doug Wimbush on bass, Keith LeBlanc on drums, and Skip McDonald on guitar. Uh, Would also feature producer and mixologist adrian sherwood uh he kind of drive this thing and you'll you'll kind of get why here in a minute tag hit was only technically credited with two albums they participated in four <laughs> the artist <laughs> 
The artists I, uh, that I just named that make up Tackhead, they began as members of the Sugar Hill Gang's house band. Damn. Yeah. If you don't, if you don't know who the Sugar Hill Gang is, the old lady in Happy Gilmore, the rap she starts, that's Sugar Hill Gang song. <laughs> That's not all they did. They also played the uh, background, the, the instruments for DJ Grandmaster Flash's 1982 hits, The Message and White Lines. Like his two biggest fucking songs. Sorry. Like his two biggest songs. <laughs> oh, the shock on Melissa's face. <laughs> did he just We're say... talking about Grandmaster Flash. <laughs> it's just the message. It broken bomb. glass. Everywhere. <laughs> So they started out as studio musicians, and like a lot of people, they looked at the musical acts they were working with and kind of looked at each other and like, hey, man, we could kind of do this. So while they were on a trip to New York, they met London-based producer Adrian Sherwood. Sherwood would hit it off with them and start working with them, pretty much using them as session musicians. They created the Tackhead Band. But their first project would be Mark Stewart and the Mafia, featuring Stewart, who was formerly of the Sherwood group, the pop group. They would really release one LP with Stewart under that name called As the Veneer of Democracy Starts to Fade, which just sounds terrible, guys. Come on. <laughs> the album would be described as a, a scary mess of random sounds, spoken word, and a tiny snippet of music processed and distorted to a grating electronic edge, which just sounds horrible. <laughs> they would go from there and join forces with Gary Kalel, who was a touring MC, and release another LP called Tackhead Tape Lines, this time under the guise of Gary Kalel's Tackhead Sound System. Still studio musicians, guys. Like, you're still not the main the main guys. They would have their, their first official Hackhead album, just them, would be called Really as a Hand Grenade. They would enlist vocalist Bernard Fowler to join the group, followed by a 90s, uh, uh, 1990 world tour. We're starting to make some headway. Now we're starting to get some of our own fame. They would follow that up with the album Strange Things, which some people would say uh, was a little bit here, but ultimately would not be well received critically. And they would be droppable. The members would go on uh, to continue as session artists or Sherwood, uh, Sherwood's artists over the next decade or two, as well as playing in different bands themselves. Like one guy started his own record label and he also plays in a couple jazz bands, but like nothing major. Like they never really hit it big after that, but they've been, they've contributed to some other stuff. But that is the story of Tackhead or otherwise known as Fats Comet. So. <laughs> well, Tackhead ended up going That's... in a different direction than what I thought it was. It, it didn't it turn out to be industrial rap, not in, not industrial grunge. <laughs> Something tells me they should have kept hanging out with uh, Sugar Hill Gang and uh, Grandmaster Flash. As, uh, those, they are still actually, you know, here we are 30, 40 years later, and they're still relevant, actually still touring. Well, let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. I am interested to hear where John lies on this. I think if, I mean, if we're able to separate Edwina from the storyline, <laughs> let's see if we're able to do that. Let's go give our final thoughts. All right, John, I was, I was saying, we'll see, I'm interested to see what your thoughts are on this episode, but I'm going to let you clear the air about Edwina. <laughs> what are your final thoughts on this episode? I, I hate it. I hate it. I hate you, Vice. You suck. <laughs> well, you got to be shooting dogs and stuff. Like, Edwina was the best. Like, you couldn't shoot that lame-ass English villain you got there. <laughs> we got to watch this goofy cartoon villain the whole episode. The one thing I liked about him was his dog, Edwina. At the very end, we shoot him. Uh, we shoot the dog. And then we jump to a scene and we, in very vice fashion, we never mention the dog again. <laughs> I, 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 I just, I don't know what to do with you, Vice. I, I really don't. This is just, it, it's a terrible episode. It's a terrible villain. <laughs> it, 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 it's a terrible ending. Why would you shoot the dog? Why do they go in their guns blazing anyway? She's being, the congresswoman is being held hostage. Like, why would you go in there just firing randomly? Just makes no sense. They should be, they should all be fired. Starting with Tubbs and Twitek. <laughs> Melissa? Advice. <laughs> what are your final thoughts? 
mine are not as fiery as John's, <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, I like Edwina too. She's kind of ugly, but <laughs> 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 I agree that this episode was not good. She, she's a good dog, Melissa. <laughs> yes, I know. She's not a looker, but she was a good dog. <laughs> I agree this episode was not good, and we should have known it was not going to be good when Joey showed his face in it <laughs> god damn you joey god damn you joey it's got the it's got the mark of joey even while he was going in that room and searching for things he was terrible at it like not putting things back the right way or anything yeah no it's not a good episode it's not good the villain is terrible it's laughable the villain is like something out of i don't even know what it's terrible 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 I mean, I like the Castillo part, you know, not where he gets shot, but where he is. <laughs> <laughs> but where everyone's like, oh, Castillo, we need you. You're the glue. And he's like, how can you come? You never come to my house then. <laughs> I'm so lonely there. Why doesn't everyone visit me? No, I think it's. See, it's, it's, it's and that's why I was, but that's why I was saying he was having such a fantastic week. No one ever comes to visit him. <laughs> he got invited out twice that week. Like that's, True. that's pretty huge for him. It does. You're right. It's the eye opening for Crockett because he is showing that he's burned out. He's done. He doesn't want to do this job anymore. It affects him now when he shoots a teenage boy. It didn't used to do that <laughs> back in the good old days when he could he could be responsible for everyone dying and not care about it. So it yeah, it, it's definitely a shade of what's going to happen in in the future. But I mean, we could have done with pretty much l losing the whole episode <laughs> and been okay. <laughs> I'm going to buck the trend here and I'm going to say, okay, yeah, Ross is bad. Like acting bad. Joey, fuck you, Joey. <laughs> but the therapy <laughs> sessions in this and the way this episode ends, and I, I would have been in with you guys except for this, if it wasn't for this last scene at the hospital, because it converted me. Sonny is there. Castillo asks for Sonny to come because he knows that Sonny is the most like him about how much he cares about the job, how much he cares about the people that work at Vice, uncompromising. He sees Sonny as like his number two, right? He's in, Sonny is in charge when Castillo is not there. So he's going to be in charge for a while now. I don't know how long Castillo's <laughs> going to be out. Unless next week they pretend like it never happened. Uh, well, <laughs> we pretended hey, Crockett was on, never shot. <laughs> yeah, but based on what the nurse was saying, I'm pretty sure he got a bullet in the spine. Like, I'd be surprised if he can even walk. <laughs> but this is a very heartwarming way to end this episode. They're nothing without each other. That team is nothing without everyone being <laughs> on it. And they're in their final days of vice. They are cracking. Castillo, he's cracking. He would have never have gone by himself. He is by the books. He was. He says himself he is debt. He was desperate to clear his own name. Sonny in his therapy sessions talking about how he can't handle this job anymore. He carries the weight. He can't let it slide. He knows all the terrible things that he's had to do for this job. He can't handle it anymore. Tubbs last week saying one of these times a woman is going to work out for me. I can't handle this lifestyle anymore. All of them are cracking, and we know that just beneath the surface, Stan is an alcoholic, sh strip club going, gambling addict. Like he is out of control too. The scene is falling apart, and this last scene really shows that what Sonny is saying: if one of them leaves, they're all leaving. If one of them's done, this team is done because they cannot go on without each other anymore. And they are the cracks are becoming bigger, and the aftershocks are greater. This team is falling apart. I, I don't think that's fair when it comes to the ladies. I, I don't think they're falling apart. They, they seem to be doing okay, not being mentioned in any of the episodes <laughs> in this final season. I don't know. Gina hasn't killed a man, has she? <laughs> Could she really be okay? She hasn't killed a guy in a while. <laughs> pretty long time. She's doing pretty good. <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goldtheheat at gmail.com. I am not playing with you. I want to hear from you. <laughs> Email us, <laughs> goldtheheat at gmail.com. Let us know what you thought about this episode. Let us know what you think about Sunny's therapy sessions. Let us know about Edwina. <laughs> <laughs> dog murderers. All of them. It's a dog murderers. Email us, goldtheheat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website, goldtheheat.com. Click on support. Find all the ways to support us. Click on subscribe on all the ways to find the show speaking of support we would love your support support step number one go to your podcast your platform of choice and leave us a review go ahead and give us five stars you know the drill five stars do it this time though please <laughs> itunes in particular if you use that platform but don't write a review 
no one ever reads the reviews. Instead, write a eulogy to Edwina. <laughs> write about how great of a dog Edwina <laughs> was. And write it right there in the review of the show. Support step number two. Check out that Patreon. Patreon.com slash go with the heat. We'd love to see your support on that. As we're racing towards the end of this show. And, you know, more hints coming out about the reboot of Miami Vice. So, you know, you want to keep your humble Miami Vice podcasters. Mm -hmm. And we accept all different types of currencies. You got loonies? Well, we accept loonies. <laughs> <laughs> Screw that humble stuff. We're the greatest Miami Vice podcast on the internet. There is no one that has done a better podcast about Miami Vice than us, considering there's only one other podcast. So this is all you've got. <laughs> This is the number one Mind Vice podcast on the internet. We would love to see your support. We really appreciate everyone that listens to this show. So I like the kid. Support step number three, email us. Go with the heat at gmail.com. Let us know what you thought about this episode. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.